So, as a kid who loved horror stories, I obviously read a lot of creepypasta in my day. For those not in the know, creepypasta are what you graduate to when you're slightly too old for goosebumps, and you keep reading them into adulthood if you're intimidated by real books. Creepypasta are horror stories written by people on the internet and posted and shared around for free. I love them because it's basically campfire stories on like a global scale, and I feel like a format like this could yield some really good results results. And sometimes it does. In the case of stories that don't work, it's usually just the one really big, huge, obvious, fatal flaw that they go too far. The best horror stories, in my opinion, have just enough creepy elements to unnerve you, but leave you wondering if it could actually be true or not. Especially because the conceit of creepypasta is that they're usually being told as true stories. The subreddit for creepypasta is an in-character subreddit where you can't say, like, nice story, good use of adverbs. You have to be like, oh my god, did you ever find the ghost's locket? A lot of the most famous creepypasta stories and characters come from the Something Awful forums. They used to have like these compilation threads where they'd be like, share your scariest true supernatural story, and then everyone would share these stories in the first person. Fortunately, but unfortunately, the best stories started getting like really known by word of mouth, so they would get reposted when the threads came back and started getting kind of their own level of fame. So all these amateur writers started to see it as their shot at fame. So everyone started trying to up the ante on their stories so that they could have the memorable one. And this basically was like an arms race of shock horror or creepy gore. Everybody wanted to have the new Slender Man, or Wire Man, or Goat Man, or Candle Lady. I just made that one up. Everybody stopped caring about suspension of disbelief, and their stories just became kind of ridiculous and not scary. I'm gonna give you guys some symptomatic examples of this using some very famous creepypastas. The Expressionless. Okay, this story is about how at the night shift at a hospital, a creepy woman with like a mannequin plasticky face shows up covered in blood. All the doctors see her and think she's so creepy and unnerving, they just start puking everywhere. Which, like, I tend to have that effect on people too. Anyway, the setup is good. Creepy lady shows up, doesn't speak, no expression, covered in blood, gets treatment, leaves. Who was she? We don't know. What was she? Something scary. That would be a good scary story to tell someone. Did it happen? It happened to my cousin. I kind of believe you. I at least believe that you believe it and you're not just lying to me. But in this story, when the lady shows up, she is actively chomping on a dead kitten. It's extremely silly. Not like if it happened, it wouldn't be silly. It's, it's silly to write. She then proceeds to like crack her neck to the side menacingly like a Japanese horror movie monster. She like bites the throats out of a bunch of doctors and goes, I am God, and then eats everybody, except one then leaves. She always leaves one person alive because dead men tell no tales. So that story's crazy and obviously didn't happen. That's not scary. It would be scary if you were there and it was happening, but when you're not there, you don't believe that it's happening. Too far. It's too removed from reality to be scary. Candle Cove. I think this story is actually one of the better creepypasta out there. It's definitely in the top 10. Just because the premise is pretty original and it's written in like a unique format where it's supposed to look like a message board. It's a bunch of people reminiscing about this old public access show starring a bunch of creepy low rent puppets. It had cute characters and cheesy slogans and then suddenly one really weird episode that like traumatized everybody who saw it. The twist ending is that the main character's mom reveals that whenever he was watching the show, he was just looking at static the whole time and she thought he just made it up but everyone else remembers it too, suggesting that something supernatural has happened. That's creepy. This one almost gets it right, it's so close. But one of the characters from the puppet show is a creepy skeleton with a top hat and a cape that's made of patchwork pieces of skin. He's literally named the Skin Taker. It just totally ruins the suspension of disbelief. No pun intended, because they're puppets suspended on strings. Suspension. 
of disbelief. The thing the characters were describing sounds like it could be a real show until they mention the skin taker. You have to believe it could be a real show for it to be scary and a kid's show character would just never be named that. When the characters are first reminiscing about the show, they're just kind of like, I remember that show. It was kind of weird. And they're describing the skin taker still in that tone of, it was kind of weird. Like, no. That's not kind of weird. That's unbelievable. Immediately you know it's not real people talking, it's just willfully stupid horror story characters, and it's ruined forever. Evidently when the show was adapted to TV, the skin taker was renamed to Jawbone. I heard that that happened because some angry fans were like, why did they change it? That's why. It's it's because it's a better name. Abandoned by Disney. This story is another one I really want to like. It has a really good backstory and it feels believable. So in this story, Disney had a jungle themed resort called Mowgli's Palace that was in North Carolina and they closed it because of local protests and lack of interest. And then it dropped off the face of the earth. Disney basically never merchandises the animated Jungle Book movie, but my disbelief can go that far. It's fine. Disney's a rich enough company that they do have a long history of deciding something's a sunk cost and just abandoning it instead of trying to make it work or demolishing it. Plus the company doesn't really like to advertise failures, so all of their abandoned stuff is kind of just immortalized on like old sad GeoCities sites, so it makes it kind of hard to prove a negative, so Mowgli's palace could exist. And then we get into the story. The main character is an urban explorer that goes to Mowgli's palace. Um, they go through everything. It's all smashed up and creepy and waterlogged. He sees, like, mutant reptiles. That's kind of dumb, but it doesn't quite ruin it, okay? And there's creepy graffiti everywhere. Uh, he assumes it's from bitter employees or locals, and it says, Abandoned by Disney. And that's a cool idea. Then the narrator goes into a room marked mascots only. Disney never calls its character suits mascots, even in employee terminology, let alone where the public can see it, but okay. He goes through an employee break area, and everything's like in disarray, like it's been left in a hurry. And then he goes into the defunct costume room. So up to this point, still good. Okay. Creepy. But then, one of the mascot suits is a photo-negative version of Mickey Mouse. So the blacks and whites are reversed, and the shorts are blue. That's really dumb. Then, he finds a human skull in the Donald Duck costume. Ah! Then, the Mickey Mouse suit stands up. Then, it says, in a Mickey Mouse voice, Wanna see my head come off? And then it pulls its head off, and then blood and gore pours out of it. This is so dumb, it's so bad. My suspension of disbelief can handle an abandoned Disney resort, even if it's themed around the animated Jungle Book movie. And I can accept that it's now an ominous, godless place to visit. And also that this guy had some creepy vibes while he was there and thought he heard whispers, that's scary. And maybe then he found evidence that something really spooky went down, cool. Yes. I'm even here for the Mickey Mouse suit moving around when he's not looking. Or maybe he turns around and it's in the standing position. Maybe he even hears raspy breathing from inside. That's really scary. Is it a guy? Is it a ghost? What does it want? Is it going to hurt him? But having it talk? Having it talk in a Mickey Mouse voice? I love listening to audio readings of this story because I like seeing when they get to that part if the narrators actually go for it and try to do the Mickey Mouse voice. It's amazing. And why is it a photo negative? Like, that's the part that ruins the story. Okay, possessed Mickey Mouse suit or psycho guy in a Mickey Mouse suit. But why would it look like a photo negative? Disney just deliberately crafted it to look scary? I'm picturing like, a jolly seamstress woman in this brightly lit Disney warehouse behind Disneyland just cranking away on her sewing machine. Yeah, this is the scary one. They said they were building a resort over like a hell mouth, so they need five of these before opening day. Why is it photo negative? Why did they commission this? I'll tell you why it's a photo negative. Because if it's just a Mickey suit, then it's just a Mickey suit. If it's a photo-negative Mickey suit, it's an original creepypasta character, and people can draw fan art and cosplay as it at conventions. The writer obviously wanted this thing to join the pantheon of famous creepypasta monsters and live in that mansion that Slender Man and Jeff the Killer take you to if you stab your friend. And fortunately, he was willing to ruin his story to do it. The Russian Sleep Experiment. This is probably the second worst creepypasta I've ever read. 
and the worst one's Jeff the Killer. The premise of the Russian sleep experiment is that Russians had an experiment on prisoners of war where they locked them up in a room and then pumped it full of gas that kept them awake for a bunch of days. By the five day mark, the subject's behavior became increasingly bizarre and unnerving as it slowly drove them insane. The researchers can only see inside through these creepy little windows. There is nothing wrong with that setup. There are enough pieces here that could be creepy. If you ignore that in real life, a guy has stayed awake for 11 days and nothing bad happened and he didn't go crazy. Maybe that's something you should Google before you write the story. From there, the guy's overly gratuitous descriptions of all the crazy stuff that happened are so absurd and over the top that I can't imagine why anyone would even find them scary. The test subjects covered the windows, but you can hear them screaming inside. That's scary. And they killed one guy and they ripped their guts out with their bare hands. And they filled the room with water and they put their guts out all everywhere. And when they took them out, they were so crazy powerful that they couldn't even take them down with tranquilizers anymore. And their hearts beat for a really long time after they bled out. And while you're doing surgery on them, they start like laughing and stuff because they like it, because they're crazy. Objectively, the silliest point comes at the very end of the story. One of the Russian guards freaks out and he's like, what are you? And one of the test subjects straight up delivers like a dramatic monologue about the duality of man. We are you. We are the madness that lurks within you all, begging to be free at every moment in your deepest animal mind. We are what you hide from in your beds every night. We are what you sedate into silence and paralysis when you go to the nocturnal haven where we cannot tread. <laughs> it's bad writing, but it's a pretty good pickup line. So that list doesn't mean that there are no good creepypasta. There are also plenty of good ones drawing a blank right now. My ideal creepypasta is Ted's caving page. In like 2001, this guy made a angel fire page about his adventures spelunking and like updated chronologically with journal entries about this creepy cave that he found with his friend. Nothing that crazy happened, but like pictures wouldn't turn out if you took them in certain scary parts of the cave and he would hear this sound like rock moving against rock and his friend's dog didn't want to go near the cave. The most concretely supernatural moment that ended up happening was at one point he cuts this rope that he was using to guide himself through the cave and he notices that there is suddenly a force on it, like something deep in the cave is pulling the rope inside. And that's like, what's at the other end of the rope? I still get like goosebumps thinking about it. The story didn't go too far and it didn't have like a crazy ending. It literally just ended with one last journal entry where he's like, I know there's something scary in the cave, but I need closure. So I'm gonna go back and I'll be posting again soon with some answers. And then he just never posts again. He's just, you know that something happened to him. The story was scary and worked because it never asked us to believe anything too far-fetched. Like, maybe it's an animal in the cave, but it's totally not an animal in the cave. It's totally like a ghost or something. If somebody wrote that story this year, it would probably end with like a pale, long-armed thing crawls out of the cave over the ledge and it's wearing like a novelty Donald Duck hat. Because that's ironic if it's a thing for kids and there's a monster. And in his hand, he's clutching a DVD of the lost episode of Caillou. And you can see on the cover that Caillou's eyes are bleeding. So this story was simple and effective and it felt real, it didn't have anything flashy. It was like the Blair Witch Project of Creepypasta. And all my other examples are like the Paranormal Activity 6, the ghost dimensions of Creepypasta. They're bad, that's what I'm saying. By the way, 
Unrelated, one of the cringiest things I've seen in modern creepypasta is people that write their stories with like a dialect. Like they want their story to come from a 70 year old grave digger in Tennessee, so they type his accent into the narration. And this is still supposed to be a true story. You know how JK Rowling types Hagrid's speech in Harry Potter? It's like that. The things I seen in Rattlesnake Gulch ain't like nothing I seen before or since. As a West Virginian coal miner, I not only have an account on somethingawful.com, but the self-awareness to type my own accent out phonetically.